Hey, this is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. Today we want to look at the question and examine the question of how are we at sharing our faith, our version of it anyway. You know, true love is not about tolerating sin in your friend's life. You know, we have to share the truth with them if we think they're in the wrong, okay? And if you don't tell them, well, then you can be held accountable to that, okay? You can be actually equally guilty of that sin, okay, because you're not telling them. So how do we share our faith effectively with them? If you truly love them, don't you want them to receive the truth? Well, well, of course you do. Okay, so if you want them to receive it, do you just plow over them with the facts and say, there it is, take it or leave it? Or do you let your love for them strategically plan how you can best reach them? We definitely need to tell others when we believe they're in the wrong. But how are we telling them? You know, what's our approach? What's our attitude when we tell them? You know, here's the thing. Our knowledge and understanding of the scriptures is truly limited. You know, (laughs) even if you've been in it for years, even if you were brought up in, in the truth and you've lived in it all your whole life, there's just, we're still so far removed from it. There's so much that has been lost over the years. I'm talking the centuries, the millennia even, okay? There's been so much lost. So, are we sure we truly understand everything like we think we do? Oh, sure, you know, we may have a good grasp on this or a good understanding on that, but do we? <laughs> you know, we think we do. And and I understand how all we, we've all got our, our opinions on stuff, and that's good, okay? But sometimes I think maybe we're overconfident in our, our opinions, you know? I can't help but think that sometimes we're living in a day that's very similar to Judges chapter 17. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. We are in a time when we truly need our King, Yeshua, to come and explain so much for us. Yet, it seems we are living in a time where everybody already has the answers. You know, just ask them. (laughs) And they're more than happy to give you their opinion, you know. And it's just amazing how we have been so far removed from all of this, but yet we think we have it all figured out. But it seems with many, they don't just want to give you their opinion, you know. They want you to believe it. And it seems that many times, you know, they will not stop debating you until you believe what they believe. You know, ah, and it gets so tiring. I don't know about you. Then, if you end up not believing what they believe, it's almost as if they feel they have the right to condemn you, to talk negatively about you, or to at least look down on you. And, you know, oh, sure, you know, they won't say that. You know, they they won't even present it that way. But a lot of times, well, actions can scream it, you know. It's almost like they have the mentality of what the disciples had back in Luke chapter 9. You know, it's funny because the disciples wanted to be like Elijah in Luke 9. And, you know, they'll... They were, you know, they just thought they were all that. They thought they had it all together, you know. In fact, let's look at that. Let's look at that verse. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, starting in verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven. Okay, now, so pause right here. This means they have been with him for some time now. Okay, he's nearing the end of his ministry. So most likely, they thought they had it all together. Okay, so let's get kind of a mindset where they're at. Let's continue. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. Now, it was a Samaritan village. You know, those people who believe differently. You know, just like the woman at the well in John 4, 7, okay? The Samaritans, we're talking about the Samaritans. They believe this and they believe that. Can you believe that type of a... So that's the people, that's the the place where they're getting ready to go. So now we've got the disciples here. They've been 
with Yeshua all this time, they think they've got it all together. They, they think that for sure they've got all the answers. And now they're going into the Samaritan's village, okay, where, of course, they know better, right? Okay, so now you, you kind of get a, a feeling of where I'm looking at here. Looking at verse 53. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading to Jerusalem. <laughs> so they're saying, oh, great. Here come some Jews going to Jerusalem. They're all just like their teachers, thinking they're so high and mighty, looking down on everyone as they sport their extra long zitzits. Okay, now, so you get the picture here. Now we got the disciples going with an attitude. Now you've got the Samaritans already probably having the same attitude. It even says because they're going to Jerusalem. So they're, they know they're Jews. So chances are there's attitudes on both sides already. We're starting this whole thing off with attitudes, it seems. You know what I'm saying? Verse 54, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Verse 55, I love this. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. He rebuked them. And they went to another village. You know, <laughs> I can't help but wonder how many people Yeshua is going to rebuke because of things like this today. You know, so many believe they have it all right. They believe that, you know, they've got it all together, just like the prophets did, you know. And they want to use that for justification and how they treat others. And I'm concerned that many have forgot what clanging symbols really is. I once saw a believer post on Facebook, I hope people will think about this. When the bridegroom comes for the wedding feast, those locked outside the door just might be those who were too busy advancing their own doctrines, arguing with others to prove their own viewpoints, and worse yet, verbally, emotionally, and spiritually attacking people out of love. You may know the truth correctly, but how are you presenting it? Remember, knowledge puffs up but love builds up. Speaking of being puffed up, consider Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, which one of these two better exemplifies your actions towards others? That being said, please consider Hebrews 12. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Notice it says, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Have you ever asked yourself, will this response cause one to be bitter? Seriously, have you ever asked that? Again, it says, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. And defile many. Now, let's think about this for a second. There are many who are watching. Is your attitude defiling them? Do people want more of what you say because of how you say it? Or 
do they want nothing to do with what you say because of how you say it? Think of it this way. James chapter 2, verse 12. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Have you ever thought that just maybe you might be getting tested on what you do and what you say? You know, think of the verse where Abraham is pleading on behalf of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah to Yahweh. He's praying to Yahweh. He's pleading to Yahweh on their behalf. Okay. Have you ever done that? Because this is Abraham, okay, the father of the faith. He is pleading to Yahweh, pleading these people's case, okay. Have you ever done that? Especially to someone who you differ with, who you disagree with, okay, firmly, all right? Think of this, because this is Abraham pleading for people who don't even care about Yahweh, okay. He's pleading their case. I truly believe this is a test that was given to Abraham to see what he was going to do for these people. Let's read it. Genesis chapter 18. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham is pleading for the whole city. He was doing this for the people. Again, people who didn't even care about the ways of Yahweh. You know, I look at this, I just go, but today I'm seeing so many people, it seems to me anyway, who are so willing to condemn people who are at least trying to serve Yahweh. Okay, so they, they, they differ on opinions on a couple of things and how you interpret it, but yet they condemn them. And here, Abraham, the father of the faith, is not only not condemning these people who are blatantly in disobedience, he's pleading for them. He is pleading to Yahweh for their sake. Abraham is pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah. At first, he gets Yahweh to not destroy the city for the sake of just 50 righteous people. The number drops to only 10 righteous people by the end of the conversation. If there was only 10 righteous people in the whole city, Yahweh would not have destroyed it. And please take note that Abraham didn't ask for the removal of the righteous and then bring judgment. He was interceding for the wicked. I personally see this as a test for Abraham to see where his heart was for the unbeliever. So my question is, where is your heart? Do you intercede for people, people I'm talking, who differ with you, firmly even, who just, who just can't see the scriptures the way you do? Do you intercede for them? Or are you more apt to just, you know, cut them down, you know, for not believing like you. <laughs> or, or maybe you say, well, you know, how in the world can they believe that? Scripture clearly says this. Well, that's being condescending. I mean, could Abraham not have said that? What is wrong with these people? Surely they know the creator of all. He could have done that. <laughs> but he's interceding for them. What are we doing? Are we more apt to condemn, cut down, mock even? Or are we more apt to intercede? <laughs> Consider this. Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot, both on the same team. <laughs> just imagine how that started out. Let that sink in just for a moment. James chapter 1, 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger 
does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Oh, but Steve, Yeshua got mad when he turned over the tables in the temple. Absolutely. I agree. It's called righteous indignation. Okay? That's what that is. Righteous indignation. He was angry out of a righteousness because of what they were doing to the temple. Okay. But fighting on how we are to interpret the scriptures? Really? That... That's what we're going to we're going to use that example as a as a justification so we can argue on how to interpret the scriptures. You know, if you truly believe you are right, if you truly believe with all your heart, as we all do on most all we on everything we believe, if we didn't if we didn't think we were right, we wouldn't believe it, right? So if you truly believe that you are right on this topic or that topic and you're talking to somebody who differs with you, if you truly believe you are the more mature in that situation or in that argument, in that, in that debate, if you will, please consider Romans chapter 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So, do you do that? Or do you please yourself by cutting them down or reasoning with them in a condescending manner? Who did Yeshua call hypocrites in Matthew 23? Fools, blind guides, snakes, vipers, children of hell. It was the Pharisees and teachers of the law. The people who knew the law but didn't follow it. Again, the people who knew the law but didn't follow it. They even taught it, but they didn't follow it. Again, they taught it, but they didn't follow it. You know, Yeshua didn't say these things to the everyday pursuer, okay? He said it to those who knew the law. They knew it, but they didn't follow it. So there's a difference here. He's not talking to people who are trying to pursue to their understanding, even if it's a very limited understanding, okay? He said it to people who knew it. He was cutting them down. I mean, letting them have it, all, all guns forward, if you will, to people who knew the law but weren't following it. So, if you're using Matthew 23 <laughs> as your justification for cutting the everyday pursuer down, you may want to reconsider that justification. Okay. You know, even if you're using this verse to cut down pastors and ministers of the day, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not even a comparison. Why? Why are you trying to use this verse to cut them down? The, the everyday pastor today, they don't know Torah. <laughs> they don't have a clue. They don't preach it, especially. How can they preach it if, they don't have, if they're clueless on it? How can we lump them together with the Pharisees and teachers of the law? That's a major difference from the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Think about that. Seriously, the, the everyday pastor has no clue about the Torah. Even if, they, even if you say they're rejecting it, okay, they're rejecting it, but they have no clue. They don't, they've never been trained on it. They, don't, they know very little. You, you, and you can say, well, they should know. Well, yeah, we, we've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there. We should have known better too. But we can't condemn them. They don't know. The Pharisees, they knew. Everything must be done in love not the desire to be right. Our Heavenly Father was patient, merciful, and gracious with us, and still is, mind you. Maybe, just maybe, we should reflect His character in that to others as He did to us. Now, let it be known, I believe there is a time and place for everything. I mean, Ecclesiastes says it, okay? My concern is, do we take the time to pray to see what time it is? Or do we just decide that for ourselves? Oh, but Steve, what about the prophets? They rebuked the people. Agreed, they did. When Yahweh told them to, okay? And even then, they rebuked the people who rejected the truth, just like Yeshua did. 
they didn't rebuke people who were genuinely trying to follow the truth. Regarding the prophets, you know, Yahweh specifically told them what to do, what to say. And if you have literally heard the voice of Yahweh telling you to condemn people, then you know what? You better do it. Okay? You have to. And I'm not here to say that, to question you if you're hearing from the Father or not. That's between you and him. All right. But if you have not literally heard the voice of Yahweh like the prophets did, and remember, if that's your justification, saying that's what the prophets did, remember, the prophets heard the voice of Yahweh telling them what to do. So, if that's what you're hearing, great. But if you're using that justification, meaning referring to them, and you haven't heard the voice of Yahweh, please remember James chapter 2. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. But Steve, what about tough love? Yes, I agree. But what is it for you? Is it about love or just wanting to be tough? I'm just saying that if you're going to use the prophets and Yeshua as a defense for your actions in condemning others, please, please be careful. Those are some pretty big shoes to be filling. Make sure you're condemning the people who they condemned. Please, please keep that in the back of your mind, okay? James chapter 5, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. You know, I believe we have forgotten what Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says. Now, now before we get to that question, what kind of teacher gets their students to learn the most? Again, what kind of teacher gets their student to learn the most? Okay, now that being asked, let's read Romans chapter 2. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? God's kindness leads us towards repentance. So, when we differed with Yahweh, it was his kindness that brought us back. How do you treat others who differ with you? James 3.9 with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. You know, blowing out someone else's candle, even if it is just a small flicker, doesn't make yours shine any brighter. If you think someone else is wrong, then you need to let them know. But if they don't change, okay, if they don't change their mind, even if you are kind, compassionate, you name it, you, you drip all the love all over that you want, okay, and, and after even all of that, they still are not convinced of your view, your perspective, and not convinced that what you're saying is right. Okay. In that, please remember, Yeshua's example is to let the good and the wicked grow together. And the time when he comes, he'll separate. Okay. He'll be the one to take care of all those issues. You don't have, you know, we, we can't force our opinion on somebody. So don't try to present your case. Do it in love, in a kind way. If they say, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't agree, then you've done your part. You can walk your way and, and, and you know you did it in a nice way and pray for them. Don't just walk away saying, I'm done, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, 
If we did that, was it in love? We got, we, we have got to do it in love. So after you're done, pray for them if they aren't seeing it. Don't, don't just, you know, let it be. Pray for them. Yeah, but Steve, love warns. Absolutely. And we should tell people, we should warn them. But how are we telling them? Just because the truth is offensive, listen to this, just because the truth is offensive, it doesn't mean we have to be. In fact, if we truly care about the people who we're ministering to, trying to reach out to, talking with, you know, debating with, discussing with, uh, whatever you want to call it, if you truly care about those people and presenting the truth to them, okay, shouldn't we try to help them receive that offense, the truth that is offensive? Shouldn't we try to help them in receiving that which is offensive? You know, it seems as if, to me anyway, there are many who only want to add to that offense, to, to, to drive it in harder. How are we helping? We aren't. We're pushing people away. If that, if that is our attitude, that is the way we're doing it, you're just pushing people away. We can't do that. We, we, we need to realize that the truth is, it, it does hurt. It, does, it is offensive at times because it goes against what we want, what we believe. And if we know that, okay, we really need to think about how we're presenting it. If we truly love these people, if you care about them, you are going to deliver it in such a way that they're going to go, wow, I never saw it that way. Or, or, or who knows? And, and they may not even, that they still may not get it. And, and if they don't, you've done your part. You've tried. You know, there are going to be those times when the truth simply hurts and there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way it is. But do you present the truth just so you can say, I'm done. I washed my hands. And I'm, I'm all, it's all over. You, know, you, you, you can do what you want with it now. Okay, I, I'm done. If we do that, what are we saying? We're basically showing I really don't care about you. If if that's if just to, just to to lay the facts out there to them and let it be that, how is that presenting the truth in love? Okay, how is that? It's not. We need to do our part as best as we can to pray for that wisdom to to deliver. That which is offensive, okay, in a way that they will receive it. That's giving forth love to them because we know it's going to be offensive, okay? If you truly care, if you truly care, don't you think we should change how we present things? If you are getting a joy or, or even a sense of accomplishment, if you will, out of being offensive when telling the truth, we have to ask ourselves, are we following 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14? Well, Steve, they said something publicly. They can be corrected publicly. <laughs> I got to tell you, I've been wanting to address this for a long time. What did Priscilla and Aquila do to Apollos? Acts 18, 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Here is a brother who had some good things in his message, but he obviously had a few things wrong in what he was preaching in public. So tell me, did Priscilla and Aquila immediately stand up and tell all the people, this guy's a false teacher? No, no, they didn't. He didn't they didn't do that at all. Did they stand up at the end of him, okay, whenever he was talking, did they stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, guys, this guy's got some things right, but he's really wrong over here. No, he didn't do that. They didn't do that to him. They pulled him aside to their home even and talked to him. Said, hey, let, let's talk about some things. I think we've got some things you may need to consider here. Okay. Now, can you imagine if Priscilla and Aquila's 
example was followed by people of today. Can you imagine if people truly followed Priscilla and Aquila's example in, in helping people? <laughs> I'll tell you right now, social media would be, social media would lose half of its content <laughs> because we would be doing something biblical. Okay, we will be doing something the right way instead of cutting people down or just or just, you know, slamming them here. Can you believe they believe this or hey, can you believe this? It would all be gone if we followed Priscilla and Aquila's example in trying to bring people into the way because they're not, you know, not everybody is wrong on everything. You know, there's some good people out there who've got a lot of good things and they're right about a lot of things. Yes, they've got some things that are that can be way off even on some things over here. That doesn't make them evil people. We need to find a way to gently bring them in. Now, now if you have done that, okay, you, you've, you try to speak to them kindly and, and try to show them, then you've done your part, okay? You don't have to convince them. You don't have to, to try to, you know, put the, pull the arm behind the back, if you will. You know what I'm saying? You've done your part. What amazes me is how when I see people, you know, when they continue to argue their point and, and, and they just, they want to be the one on top. You know, they want to be at the end of the end of the conversation, they want to be the one on top. And it seems many are more concerned about proving their point than being right in a, in a fight or in a debate, then they are more concerned about planting a seed in a fellow brother or sister and letting the Father grow it in them. You see, the Father's the one. He'll open their eyes. Yes, He can use us in this. And He does use us, okay? But he, it doesn't mean we're going to automatically see them, boing, you know, change their mind. Hey, oh my gosh, I see what you're saying now. Thank you so much. It doesn't happen that way all the time. A lot of times, even in these things about which we disagree on, it's all about planting a seed here and say, you know what, just think about it, pray about it. You know, you don't have to agree with me right now, just think about it. But far too often I see, I see people just cramming their opinions down other people's and and, and it just it, it pushes us away how can we do that if you're right and you may you may very be one may be sorry 100 percent correct on your view but man if you're if your presentation is wrong and you're doing more damage to the gospel than you think okay you can say it's out of love you your intent may be out of love oh i know i know most everybody who I have talked to or seen discussing and stuff, and even if they they come at it in a in a wrong way, I know their their heart is in the right spot. Their delivery just isn't okay. So uh, even in this, please please don't think I'm judging, because I know all of us. You know we've we've all been there. When you this is completely off my notes. I'm going to lose my notes here. <laughs> um, when you get excited about something, man, it, it's that zeal of that excitement oh my goodness gracious you know that's omgg by the way if you're going to use it omgg oh my goodness gracious it's like we, we get excited excited and we go oh my goodness gracious look at this, this is so true and and we want to we want to tell everybody about it and, and then what do we do we we try because of the excitement we we don't mean to but we force it on people i've been there we've all been there we can't do that we just need to pray that you know do our best, you know, to, to hold that excitement back and, and let it be there because they need to know we're excited about it. You know, I mean, it's, it's something we believe is true. But when we deliver it, say, man, I'm excited. You got to just, just consider it. Just pray about it. And then, and if they go, oh, well, I don't know. And then they try to give you scriptures and they say, okay, well, that's cool. I, I've seen that before too, but, but look at this and just pray about it. If we would deliver our stuff in that kind of a way, do you know how much better things would be? <laughs> I think it would be really cool. But far too often, I've seen, we have all at one point or another tried to be the one on top, tried to get the last word in. And folks, it doesn't work. You can't do it. You know, the funny thing is that most of the arguments that I see amongst people today are, it's arguments amongst people who already believe the Torah is forever. Okay, you know, 
Can't we just rejoice in that? Can't we rejoice in that we agree the Torah lasts forever? It is eternal. I mean, how cool is that? You know, okay, so we, we differ on our opinions here and there on, on how to interpret this verse regarding the Torah or, or the calendar or, or the name. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Can't we at least rejoice that we're at least in agreement that it's forever? He, he's at least brought us all this far that it's not done away with, and, and we're all trying to pursue it. Man, I just I get excited just thinking how cool it would be if we could all just <laughs> come together, at least on that, you know. You know, I, I just, the problem that I see with that is that for many people, that's not good enough. You know, for many you have to believe their way of Torah. You have to believe how they interpret it. And then they, next thing you know, they start cramming it down your throat. And folks, it just, let's, us, let's let Yeshua straighten that out. We believe Torah is forever. Let's pursue it the best that we can to our understanding that he has given us at this moment in time. Okay. When Yeshua comes, he'll straighten it all out for us. He'll say, you were right there and you were wrong here, but you had that right. Good job. And next thing you know, we're all, and you know, I will gladly, I mean, I will gladly give you the highest five ever if you were right on something that I was wrong. Because at that moment when he comes, I really don't care. I'm just going to be happy to see him. and He's telling us what to do, you know. I wish well, we need that. Okay, we, we need to have a heart. To just seek him. We don't have to we don't have to prove everybody is wrong and that we're right on everything. Seek him and pray for the others if if you disagree with them. If you really love them and are concerned about them, pray for them. Don't argue with them. You know, I, I remember one time <laughs> talking with a brother on a topic that we differed on, you know. And we bantered back and forth through emails for a while, and and I was seeing this thing, and at one time, then he started seeing my perspective, and we kept going back and forth. And in one of my responses, I said, "Okay, well, if if this is what we're supposed to believe, what do we do with this verse? Because I'm struggling with this over here, and this, and that, and this, and that." And you know, so I and then I hit send, hit an email, and um, a day or two went by, I didn't get anything back from him, and then I started thinking. You know, after not hearing back from him, it hit me. I'm going, oh, no. You know, I'm thinking, what if I stumped him and he's in crisis mode? You know, and crisis mode is it's basically that moment when your back is up against the wall on what you believe. And, and you're realize, realizing for all of a sudden that what you believe may not be just may not be 100% correct, that it actually may be wrong. And when I thought that, I'm going, oh, no, if he's there. I mean, my heart immediately sunk. And I'm just going, oh, dear Father. I mean, we've all been there. No one wants to be wrong, you know. And though, you know, I wanted to be right, you know, we all do, right? Like I said. But at that moment, I didn't want to be the winner of this debate. You know, I, 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 want, I didn't want that. You know, um, I was hoping and praying so hard that if his view could have had any biblical merit whatsoever, that I was just hoping that he could possibly find something at least to bring up to support his view, even just a little bit, even if I disagreed to the interpretation or whatever. I was just I was just thinking, man, Father, if there's any any legitimacy in his view right now, just reveal it to him. You know, I just don't because I just, you know, when when you don't I don't like crushing somebody. Oh. It makes me feel sick. Because I know I've been there. You know, when, when, you, when you've held on to something and you go, man, this is right. And all of a sudden, someone shows you you're wrong, especially if they do it in a negative light. You know, it's like, oh. but we've been there, you know, and 
who wants that? You know, and I just, my heart went out for him. And, and if he was truly wrong at the same time, I was praying for him. If, if it was truly wrong, the view that he held, that, you know, I just prayed that the Father would just soften his heart and, and just, you know, slowly and gently reveal it to him and, and even give him an excitement that, hey, this is a new founding truth. I'm opening it to you. You know, be excited about it. Don't be bumming that you're that you're that you were wrong. Be excited that I'm revealing something new. That's what I was praying for. You know, and yeah, because nobody wants to be wrong. And all I could do was just pray for him, and just I, I just I couldn't stop praying. You know, because I've been there. And how many times have we been in debates? How many times have we? wanted to prove ourselves right and fighting for that victory. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and never realizing that that victory is crushing a fellow brother. Think about that. Oh, you know, you can say, oh, but Steve, you know, we're supposed to, you know, get our fellow brothers in, in the truth and, and lead them. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, we, we should do that. We have to do that. Iron sharpens iron, right? But, you know, I think we forget that it's the Spirit's job to open up the people's eyes. It's not ours. Okay, so keep that in mind. Yes, he uses us. I agree. In, in, in conversations even like this that I'm discussing, you know, we were having, he uses us in all this kind of stuff, iron sharpening iron. But I just want to make sure that I've got a right attitude in it because I know I'm not right on everything. Goodness gracious me. We all are wrong on something. Okay, we have to realize that. You know, our attitude should be a hunger for truth, a hunger for truth, not a hunger for victory, not a hunger for being right or, or, or proving someone wrong to make us look better, okay? Man, that's so not what it's about. This mentality of winning a debate is nothing more than the song, Another One Bites the Dust, flowing through our veins. I'm serious. You know, the adrenaline for victory can blind our love for our brothers as we try to crush and rip them to threads. And while you're taking your bows, okay, and, and receiving the all the clapping and the applauding from the handful of people on social media who are applauding you and just boosting your ego, you know, what does your path of victory look like behind you? Are you missing the mark? Blinded by your lust for victory? You know, we can do a lot more damage, a whole lot more damage than what we think when we let our pride take over. Doesn't happen always, I know. But if you are more focused on victory in a, in a, in a debate, <laughs> it can do a lot of damage. You know, Luke 631 says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Yes, of course, we're supposed to help one another come to the truth. That's a given, okay? Or at least see the truth in a better understanding, you know. Uh, uh, but there's a right and wrong way in doing it. And that right and wrong way starts with attitude. You know, we, we need to stop trying to be the victor and stop trying to prove ourselves being the ones in the right, okay? We need to start praying that the Father gives us wisdom and knowledge in, in how to effectively share his truth to others, close brothers or not close brothers, but to how to effectively share his truth to where others will receive it. I mean, just as we, we mentioned at the beginning of this teaching, how do we effectively tell people? This is how. Second Peter chapter 1. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. 
For if you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Okay, now look at this. He's telling us, if we possess these qualities, we will not be ineffective or unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord. Now, that tells us that we can be ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge. You know, look at these. These are the things that make us, make us effective and make us productive. Now look at verse 9. It says, But anyone who does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Please don't fight to be the last man standing. Pray for wisdom in lifting your brothers and sisters up. You know, don't continue to beat someone up with your current point of view. Speak your understanding. Yes, again, we need to do that. But if they don't agree, pray for them. Pray. Lift them up. You know, how can we say we are loving them if we aren't praying for them? Seriously, I mean, think about that. You know, we should pray also for ourselves because, you know, we, what if we're wrong, you know, in, in this? What if, and even if, even if you, quote, win the debate, okay, you could still be wrong. <laughs> you, just, you just had a better way of saying your view may at that time. We need to pray for ourselves that we're not blinded by our own pride. You know, think of it this way. Think of what you held to 10 years ago. Okay, 10 years ago, whatever you held to. At that moment in time, I bet many of us would have fought, I'm right, at that time. We, we, we would have taken anybody on because, doggone it, we knew we were correct, right? And yet here we are, 10 years later, and we don't quite believe the same way. Okay. But yet, 10 years ago, we would have argued and argued and argued over those certain points. The points in which, well, we've kind of changed our mind today. Okay, so we can't be so blinded that that can't happen again. I mean, though, yeah, we've got a lot of good stuff that supports our view. But as far as we knew back then, 10 years ago, we had a lot supporting us then too, right? But then the Father opened our eyes on some more stuff. How do we know that can't happen again? You know, if you're the last man standing, did you really win? Did you really win? Or did you just make it to where you're all alone? How are we treating others and presenting the truth? How are we treating them and presenting the the truth, our current version of it anyway. How are we treating others when we present the truth? Well, that's all I have. I'm asking you to please think about it. Pray about it. Please think about this and pray about it. <laughs> but more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, shalom.